director of Mind Tree Limited. Uh, the plenary session is going to be on entrepreneurship, building a business around an idea. Director of Mind Tree Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, let me take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you to the day two of the entrepreneurship summit, of the fourth entrepreneurship summit in Bangalore, which is themed Growth Hack. I hope each one of you enjoyed the sessions and the panels we had yesterday. And I promise you that we have an equally impressive lineup of speakers and panels for today. Also, this afternoon, we have the top five, three, uh, top five teams of the National Business Case Challenge who will be presenting their ideas. This will be the second time YI Bangalore will be hosting it. And I feel these ideas and this in initiative to spur entrepreneurship among, among youngsters at this young age will definitely go a long way. Also, just you know, given this time, I would like to thank my team, YI Bangalore, each member of YI Bangalore, as well as YI Maisu, who have worked tirelessly over the last two months to put this great session together. Lastly, I would like to say that an entrepreneur's journey involves constant learning, continuous innovations, failures along the way. But I believe that in a journey and a sessions like this, you will find valuable inputs that will help you start your business, run your business, and grow your business. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome our next speaker. I'm sure people in Bangalore, people in the IT industry know him. He's the CEO and MD of Mindtree. He is a 35-year-old IT veteran, started his career with uh, Wipro. 2010, Bloomberg named him one of the most successful businessmen of the year. With no further ado, I would like to Welcome Krishnubar Natarajan sir to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. I know in the first session in the morning, it's always difficult to get your attention. And with the weather being what it is outside, gloomy and dull, I know there's a little bit of lethargy. So let me try and get some action around it. This plenary session was about building business around an idea. Like George said, I think clearly the intention of CI Young Indians is to really try and instill saying how many people can really build successful businesses. And in a way, it's something which is very close to my heart. Uh, I've always been a student of entrepreneurship. While one has built a company, I think there's so much to learn observing learning from other entrepreneurs. So rather than trying to do a theoretical pitch, I'll really talk about what is it I've learned, what is it I've observed. Before really getting into it, I'd really like to state that there are certain myths about entrepreneurship, which in a way is really something which is in your mind. So I'd just like to sort of put forward some thoughts on what those myths are and why they should not really stop you from building your idea to a business. So the first myth which I hear from many people is, you need to be really born with a silver spoon to be in the business. So I think it's the most untrue statement. Uh, I think George did mention about the IT industry, but if you just look at IT industry as an example. Starting from Mr. Murthy to Jerry Rao to number of names which can be talked about to Raman Roy and so many others. I think we're all ordinary people who built great enterprises and value to their stakeholders. And it's not just the IT industry. I was just meeting with Mr. Uday Kotak a couple of days back, uh, and he's a remarkable example of having built a $20 billion 
market cap organization. And what many of us may not know is, Uday was born in a joint family with there are 60 people sharing one kitchen. That's how he really grew. So I think the first myth about entrepreneurship is, you don't need to have a silver spoon to build a successful enterprise. Uh, and probably my colleague Mukhi here is there, who's slowly demonstrating that idea of saying that, yes, everybody can build an enterprise. So, the second key myth is, I think it's difficult to build a global business out of India. Here again, taking the example of the IT industry, this is probably one industry where without demonstrating success in the domestic market, the IT industry really expanded outwards. And today, it's a poster child of how a well-managed, well-governed industry can deliver significant value to stakeholders. So, so if those cobwebs are removed from your mind, I really want to place why today is probably the best time to start an enterprise. So, everybody talks about a VUCA world. There's so much of volatility, there's uncertainty, the world is complex, and clearly there's so much of ambiguity. But believe me, that's really the best time when you can start because customer needs are changing. New white spaces are becoming available and ideas are really plenty. Because businesses at the end of the day get built because there's an innovation in a product, a process or a service. And with so much of change happening, there is no other option today or it is probably the best time to start a business. And if you look all around you, I think the velocity of innovation, both in our personal lives and in enterprises, is possibly 10 times more than what it was even a few years back. But the key factor you have to think of is while ideas may be plenty, it is happening all around the world. There are multiple people probably thinking of the same idea which you're thinking. So, how do you move with agility and speed? How do you get to scale fast? It's very important because if you don't get to scale fast, somebody may just overrun your ideas. And I'll talk about some of my experiences on building scale. So, as you think of even starting a business, if the environment earlier was, let's have a good idea, let's build a proof of concept, and then we'll, over a period of time, build scale, today you have to think of continuous innovation. You can't rest with your initial idea. You have to think of continuous scaling and possibly continuous integration. All of it you need to do at the same time, which really means like you are on a freeway going at 150, kilometers an hour and you have to change the wheels of the car as you're doing it. Uh, so, from an external environment perspective, I think today is probably the best time to start a business. But that's also supported by what I see as enablers for helping new companies come in. Now, I'm not sure how many of you tracked a study by Professor Richard Foster of Yale University. This was done about two years back. The real headline of that research was that the average lifespan of companies is coming down and coming down dramatically. While in the 1920s, the average lifespan of companies was 67 years. When they last looked at it two years back, the average lifespan of companies had come down to 15 years, which means Many times, I think in my mind, companies like Mindtree, which are already 16 years, are almost like fossils. There could be any time which somebody will just make us extend. And that's a great opportunity for new entrants, because if existing companies are going to fall by the wayside, it's a great opportunity for new entrants to come in. And the same research predicts by 2020, 80% of today's S&P 500 companies will not be there. So believe me, there can never be an opportunity like this. Uh, 
The second key element is I think the ecosystem has developed. Uh, today, I think you can think of an angel funding system which is getting robust across India. There is certainly a very healthy scheme by which ideas are moved into proof of concepts to businesses. Industry associations are playing a part in it. When I was the chairperson of NASCOM, about three years back, I launched a program called the 10,000 Tech Startups. Uh, and the ambition was in India, within the next five years, we should have 10,000 startups which should come up. Uh, and with an objective saying, make it easy, like switching a TV on with a remote. Uh, so that led to a lot of physical infrastructure being created. Just within 100 meters of the Leela Hotel is what we call a startup warehouse, which is a fully furnished 50,000 square feet, where today about 40 startups function. Many of them come with an idea, meet with a mentor, mentor panel. If the idea is great, they come on a Friday evening, Monday morning, the team of four or five people are working there to make that idea into a business. So, so I think the ecosystem has dramatically changed. And here again, there is a myth about ecosystem. How many of you are from large companies? Just as a guess. Or is it purely mostly people who are venturing into entrepreneurship? I see not too many people are. You're hesitant to sort of raise your hand. Maybe uh, without sort of getting into that. I think large companies are becoming a great place to really start honing your skills in entrepreneurship. Uh, I think increasingly larger companies are realizing that innovation happens within smaller organizations. Uh, so many of them have their own approaches to driving entrepreneurship. Again, quoting the Mindtree example, we have been running a program what we call the 5 by 50. The simple element of that is if somebody has an idea which they can build into a $50 million business in five years, we are willing to listen. And it is like an internal business plan. We evaluate it like a venture capitalist. We fund people. Almost about 14 different proposals like this has come. And it's not that the company invested substantive amounts of some cumulatively we would have invested less than probably $10 million. Uh, today, only about four of them are alive because we also have the discipline of killing ones which have not reached scale. But the interesting part is the first one, which has really gone to a reasonable scale, starting this year, we really said the people who came out with the ideas have to be the majority owners of the enterprise. So we spun it off as an independent enterprise. They now go across every company to get business. And Mindtree is a minority stakeholder into it. So for some of you, if you're working with large companies, believe me, there's no learning ground other than a well-managed large company. And it's a great opportunity to try out your entrepreneurship activities within the large companies to get yourself familiar with what does it make to get your first customer. So with that background, having established some myths of entrepreneurship are not relevant, today is probably the best time to start a business. I'd really like to leave with you what I call 456. Four being what I believe are the four pillars of entrepreneurship. If you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, I think you should think hard about these four pillars of entrepreneurship. The first thing, is entrepreneurship is about relentless positive optimism. I specifically emphasize on the word relentless because as entrepreneurs, you cannot give up on your idea. I spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs. Many times I spend my weekends because that's really what gives me a lot of positive energy. And I find people a little bit with drooping shoulders, sometimes doubting, saying, you know what? I don't know whether this idea will work. My advice to them is, if you don't have commitment on an idea, please get out. You have no business to be an entrepreneur. The second key element is entrepreneurship is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Because many times I also meet with the entrepreneurs 
who really think it's a sprint. It's very interesting, about a couple of years back, I met an entrepreneur, extremely bright person, had a great idea. So I was asking him, saying, you tell me, how are you going to get your first customer? How are you get, going to get to your first five customers? He said, you know what, the first customer, this is what I'll do. But five customers, to be honest, I don't think I'm going to wait till then. I know somebody else will buy me out. So in a way, I think he was looking at entrepreneurship as a slot machine. Entrepreneurship is not a slot machine. It is about running a marathon, planning for segmented pain, because I think if many of you who are runners will realize that there is a sense of segmented pain in a marathon or entrepreneurship. The third aspect is entrepreneurship is about building a temple. I think it's very different from building a structure. In building a temple, there's a lot of emotional quotient which you invest in it. So I think entrepreneurship is not about just the physical energy. It is really putting all your emotional quotient into it. So think of building a temple, not necessarily just a structure. And the fourth element, I think many people either do not have or do not exhibit it. Entrepreneurs love money. Let me be very clear. I think there's nothing wrong in terms of loving money. But what is wrong is being greedy about it. When I talked about building an enterprise not being a slot mission, that's being really greedy. So I think you have to love money. That's what will drive you towards success. But don't be greedy about money. And that has a very key implication in terms of who do you choose as partners in building an enterprise. Uh, I'm sure some of you track and I think there's a recent press report in terms of a well-known PE player, how a lot of their investments have got into more legal disputes. My belief is if you're really underlying root cause for those disputes, it's because I guess both the investor as well as the entrepreneur are greedy, which is why it leads to significant differences of opinion leading to more a very nasty situation. But while you love money, I think you need to treat investors' money as your own and respect it. And I think that's a very important aspect of how you build an enterprise. Here again, the one outstanding example of it is Mr. Asim Premji. Way back in sometime, I think in the mid-90s, I'm not sure many of you know that Wipro started a business in finance, which is consumer asset lending and so on, which became a complete disaster. And part of the losses, Mr. Premji personally sort of uh, funded that. And once I found him moving around in a very old Ford car, or at least it was uh, a nasty looking Ford car. So I asked Mr. Premji, saying, Mr. Premji, why are you traveling by this? I thought you can sort of uh, take some other car. He said, you know what? This is an asset which we had to possess back because the consumer didn't pay. And this is a part of what my stakeholders have lost out. So even though, as per the norms of the company, I'm eligible to get a new car, I said, I'm not going to waste stakeholders' money. I would rather use this, which otherwise as an asset will go unutilized. A great sense of purpose from somebody who's, at one point in time, was the richest person in the world. But I think respect for investors' money is a very important aspect. So, so I believe these four clearly are the pillars of entrepreneurship irrespective of what enterprise you build. You build a technology company, you build a logistics company, I think these are very, very important. Uh, with that, let me move on to what I have seen, observed as five tips to build a business. Because when I said the lifespan of companies are shortening, companies today survive only for 15 years years, how do you really survive? One is clearly there's no business without scale. I think gone are the days when you can do what you call lifestyle businesses. I'm happy just doing a small little business. It gives me enough of money. I don't think lifestyle businesses have a part in the commercial world. So you have to build comfort with scale. 
Because that's something which I observed many entrepreneurs saying that, you know what, I've done this, but the moment I expand into two geographies, the moment I expand into five cities, I think I lose control, so I would rather stay so. I think it's clearly something which you have to build comfort with scale. The second key element is, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, you have to scale your intellect. Because just like we talk in terms of being relevant in the organization by constantly learning, I think entrepreneurship is also about scaling your intellect, seeing what are the changes which are happening, both from your customer viewpoint, market, and how are you really connecting the dots. The third element is organizations have to change. You have to change visibly and perceptibly. Because if you're saying the world is changing, the world is complex, by just being the same, you're not going to succeed in the future. And change gets driven when the leader wants the change to happen. So organizations need to change visibly and perceptibly every five years. That's how you'll survive even for 15 years. Believe me, if you're not going to change, you're not even going to survive for those 15 years. Reputation is becoming a key element. It's not just a key element for customers. I think the best people would love to come and work for you when you have a certain reputation. So scale reputation, that's a very important fact. As business people, many times we don't give adequate attention to how are we scaling reputation. And lastly, in an uncertain world, I think the organization needs to have the capability to scale adversity. Nothing is going to go as per plans, and many times, you're really going to be stuck with major disasters. Let me really share with you, I'm sure it's not much publicized, uh, but certainly I think there would have been elements of it written, even in the short history of Mindtree. I think what happens typically in a firm is we started in 99, had a great start, we were the fastest growing company, listed the company in 2007. So practically, I think we got into a mindset saying nothing could go wrong with us. After all, we are the guys who have done everything and a certain sense of complacence, a certain sense of what you could call intellectual arrogance crept in. What did we do? We really said now we can conquer the world. So we go into building a mobile phone product as a white label product. And we said that is what will really scale us, accelerate us rapidly. Believe me, a completely illogical step for a company which is primarily a services company, getting into building a product which is more a consumer and a lifestyle device, which changes rapidly. Yes, we had the technology capability, but we certainly didn't have the market and the consumer psyche and understanding. So what happened was, it was a complete disaster, unmitigated disaster. We lost $15 million in that, wrote off the investment, and clearly the market punished us for that. Uh, a company which used to be probably the best, an IPO which got oversubscribed 55 times. Uh, investors, their value came down to 20% of what they invested in. And that was really a lot of people to call saying, you know what, you guys are on your deathbed. A very well-meaning person who's always a friend told me, I know you invested all your life savings in Mindtree. I don't think you'll get out of this mess. You better provide for your family because it's really a matter of time before the company will really sort of die down. But the fact is it certainly got the company together. I think with what I call relentless positive optimism, which frankly in that scenario, there was no reason for us to be relentlessly optimistic. I think we moved out of what we did, acknowledged our mistakes and really got it. The reason for sharing this is I think in building an enterprise when I talked about planning for segmented pain, I think organizations also have to build the capability to face adversity. And that's what will really help you survive and stay beyond 15 years. So, so those are really my five tips on how do you survive beyond 15 years.
And let me come to the last part of what I wanted to share. Because at the end of the day, enterprises are built by leaders. And a lot of success is dictated by your mindsets. So let me just talk about six key mindsets, which I think you need to change. And the first, and what I think is most important for somebody wanting to build a business, is when you're thinking of building a business, you have to fail fast and fail cheap. Because a lot many times I find entrepreneurs stuck to their ideas where there is no customer who's willing to pay money. So the first question I ask entrepreneurs is that, is there a money paying customer for the problem which you're trying to solve? Uh, and let me tell you, in today's environment, failure in entrepreneurship is not a stigma. It's actually a badge of honor because you have done something, you know what didn't work. So everybody really acknowledges, yes. And I'm not sure how many of you have read a book which came out three, four years back on building billion dollar enterprises, the unicorns as it's called today. And a lot of people talk about the unicorns. But the interesting aspect is only one in 20,000 ideas reach that stage, which necessarily means 19,999 fail. So if you fail, fail fast, fail cheap, and that's a mindset issue. For you to acknowledge, yes, I think this doesn't work, let me move on. The second thing is you are the company salesman. At the end of the day, whether you're selling a, a product to a consumer or to an enterprise, people buy from people. And in the early stage, you have to hit the streets get the first few customers, get the few first few consumers. There can be no substitute for it. Because that's again something which I find with many entrepreneurs saying, you know what, I did an angel round, I've raised a series say of one million, I'm going to get a sales manager, I'm going to get this, and then I'm going to sort of sit back and think strategy. Dumbest thing to do. Because strategy can be figured out at any point in time, but Executing, getting customers is the job of the founder. Think of the enterprise as a child, because I think many of you would be parenting children, and I think you require different approaches at different stages of the growth of a child. You need a mix of team which is different, which complements your strengths, but at the same time, you would require different horses for different courses. The reason why I'm pointing it out again as a mindset is I used to run a program in NASCOM which used to be a six months mentorship program, which is a fairly intense thing where the end objective was we will move the company to a different orbit of business. That was the real intention. But in some of those, the diagnostics was, you know what, as the CEO, you're constraining the company. So you better move out. and. Let's get a proper business person as a CEO. That was probably the worst mentorship which many of those enterprises got. And many of them were extremely critical and upset by such a feedback. But I think if you change your mindset to say, well, I started a company, I reached it to a certain stage, but now somebody else needs to take it on to the next stage, that mindset is very important. The fourth, which I probably think is the most important, is get the culture right. I think that's very important. If you want to survive, whether in a good time or in the worst of times, I think the company culture is extremely important. Uh, there's a great article by Shumantra Goshal, who's unfortunately no more on smell of a place. I would certainly urge some of you to read that. Very subtly it establishes how culture will eat strategy for breakfast. I think it's a very, very important element of it. The fifth element is many of us are successful executors. We think, you know what, I grew the business of this company from X to Y, so all of this should be easy for me. Believe me, entrepreneurship is something which really grounds you 
because your past success is certainly not an indicator of what you'll do in the future. So think of yourself as saying, you know what, I'm starting my life all over again. And I have to prove myself in this area, in this business. Because if you start with the intention saying, you know what, I was very successful, you'll not see some of the bottlenecks, some of the constraints which come ahead of you. So start all over again. Become in your mind an intern, become in your mind a person who's starting your career afresh. And finally, the sixth mindset, I think, is which is very important. Being a founder, yes, it represents a certain level of ownership. Yes, if the enterprise is successful, it represents personal financial success. But beyond that, I think it's also a stewardship. As entrepreneurs, I think you have the responsibility to really say, what is the legacy I'm really going to live behind? Because if you really think the enterprises which you start are going to live beyond your lifespan, I think your legacy is very, very important. So what is absolutely important is to do what is right, not what is convenient. And that is what will really set apart your enterprise from the millions of ones which are around. Uh, and Ensuring that you have a mindset of stewardship and a responsibility of what is it I'm giving back to the society is very, very important. And that's what will really create a far more, I would say, vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem. It will enable a thousand flowers to bloom. And that will really create the impact of what really we believe entrepreneurship should be doing. And I do hope many of you are able to get into that mindset of a stewardship and giving back to the society which really made successes possible. And all the very best for that. Thank you so much for this option. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Krishna. Uh, could you open uh, the thing for uh, two quick questions? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we'll take two quick questions. Anyone has a question for Mr. Krishna? See, my view of the IT services business is it's not a winner-take-all industry. What I mean by winner-take-all is there's not going to be one or a few dominant players. The fundamental premise being, I think, the needs of the customer are changing. Today, the customer is definitely wanting expertise. When I say expertise, in a parallel, if you look at the medical industry, 10, 15 years back, any of us had a problem, we used to go to the general practitioner. Today, we probably go to a pediatric cardiologist or somebody who's just focusing on just the elbow sort of related muscle diseases and so on. So the IT service is becoming like that. So when expertise and relationships are important, it will be a fragmented market share. There will be certainly the large players who compete on the scale which they have. But I think that space is probably open globally for about 10, 15, or 10, 12 companies. Amongst the current companies, if I say that companies are going to die down, a few will certainly die off. Uh, there is also a space for comp which we strongly believe in, like Mindtree, where we say we are not in every space, we are specialists in some areas. And there is certainly a space for smaller, nimbler, far more expertise-driven companies. I think there's a space for everyone. Sir, my name is Anirudh. I'm yes. from China, and thank you for that very fascinating talk. I have a question, and this is uh, namely to do with, uh, with organizations which focus namely on socio-political causes, for example. Ostensibly, there is no product per se in, in most cases, and normally organizations jump into bringing nonprofits. I was extremely interested in your comments on scalability. Without 
they're immediately jumping into the non-profit paradigm. Could you help me embark on a thought process which would help me think about an organization, an entrepreneurial venture, which would serve a socio-political cause by being a for-profit organization and by being scalable at the same time, not compromising on its uh, activities and its causes because of uh, shareholders, because of market compulsions, mo profit motives and things like that? No, I think that's a very interesting question. What I do believe very strongly is that uh, there is certainly a space for what I think is not for loss organizations. Because uh, if you look at NGOs, many times they are left at the mercy of people funding them all the time. Uh, so anytime you have a chance, uh, uh, go to a website called svpindia.com. Uh, it is Social Venture Partners. Uh, this is an initiative which number of professionals have together started. It is functioning in Bangalore, in Pune, in Mumbai. The fundamental purpose being that the organization funds social enterprises, but with an intention to scale them so that they'll have two parts of the enterprise, one which does service and the other one which is not for loss enterprise, which in turn starts on a regular basis funding the social enterprise. So models like that are available already out of the, I would say, 17 organizations which SVP India has funded. I believe already four or five of them are really becoming self-sustaining. That's the real intention. But even coming to a corporate example, I'll give, because I'm very familiar with what we do at Mindtree. I think one of the ways in which we want to give back to society is really using our technology capability to solve large social problems. Uh, so when you get a time, go to a site called igotgarbage.com. I got garbage, a single word. What we've done is we have leveraged technology to completely uh, map the supply chain of garbage collection, starting from a rack picker. So we formed a cooperative society of rack pickers in Bangalore. We manage about 12 wards. Uh, we've got 2,000 rack pickers in that system. Again, not to give a long answer, the net impact of having done that for a year is that the earnings of the rack pickers have gone up three times because we have cut middlemen and really made the supply chain far more efficient without middlemen. Corporates like Unilever, Zoari Cements are very happy because they get a very predictable source of dry waste for their power needs. Uh, and today, we are certainly thinking of scaling it. Already 10 cities in India are interested in it. We are giving it like an open source to them. And we want to make it as an ERP for social enterprises. That's really the intention. But it will be a not-for-loss unit. It's a part of, yes, our CSR. It's a part of our larger theme of saying, how do we leverage our technology capability to solve large social problems? But I think there are models available. So, uh, if I'd like to add to that, there is one good example of uh, an NBFC called uh, Janalakshmi Finance. Yes, yes. The story of the promoters, very interesting, Mr. Ramesh Ramesh, Ramesh he's, Ramesh. On your board he's the independent member of yeah. So, uh, he's also got the which focuses on urban poor, elevating the... the urban poor, poor, women also. Urban poor, poor, women. And he's also done a great cause. It's not exactly profit that's driving him. He's put his shares in a separate trust and he believes he has a social cost that he's running his business for. And they recently got the license for small banks. Small banks, sir. So there are a lot of examples where I've seen, you know, like you said, it's not for profit but not for loss as well, you know. It's like a, they make sure it's scalable at the same time. So there are a lot of examples and I see a lot of these emerging I know this, a flash which is coming up that we've already exceeded time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Krishna Kumar. Thank you. It was great having you here. But before you step off, uh, I would request George to please hand over a small token of appreciation oh from our side. Thank you for making time and coming today. Thank you. No, because you're calling thank people you. from CIA, you shouldn't be doing all this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.